Uh, I'm uh, Brent Welch. I'm Director of Software Architecture at Panassas. Uh, I'm a distributed file system guy. I've been involved with the PNFS effort from um, for a long time, from the beginning. Let's see if I can drive. So why a standard for parallel I.O.? After all, you know, Panassas has the best uh, parallel file system out there, and uh, Luster is the best parallel file system, and GPFS is the best, and iBricks is really good, and CXFS is really good. So um, all those file systems are great, uh, but the they're proprietary, so uh, they have their own file system clients, they speak their own protocols, and so you make your choice and you pick your vendor and uh, you tend to get stuck. Um, NFS was a, uh, a standard a long time ago and it was uh, you know invented by Sun, but it turned out to be very good for people like NetApp and later BlueArk and other customers, so other, other vendors. So, Standards are good for the um, good for the community. They're good for vendors. They're good for customers for obvious reasons. Um, in specifically for uh, uh, well for PNFS, we're addressing a performance issue with NFS that I'll explain in a little bit more detail. And performance is always very interesting. And so um, there's been quite quite a bit of interest in the NFS vendor community for um, parallel I.O. Sometimes people ask, you know, well, gee, you know, you, Panassas, you're working hard on PNFS. Isn't that risky? Won't that be helpful to NetApp, for example, because they really don't have an HPC system? And, you know, I say bring it on, right? So it, it does level the playing field, but we, uh, just like NetApp, thinks that they have the best filer head and they were able to compete with other um, uh, NFS vendors on the strength of their server. You know, Panassas thinks we have the best uh, parallel file system and so if there's broader competition, we'll be able to compete head to head. Um, and so the market will tell, right? The, the market will bear that out. Um, let's see. Um, also, another theme, you know, what about open source? You know, do we need uh, a standard parallel file system or can we just use Luster, for example? Um, and I think open source is very important. As you'll see, it's very important for the client side. Um, but as I've said before, I think um, server vendors are going to differentiate themselves on what's happening on the server side. Um, and there's plenty of, oper uh, plenty of different vendors that are in the game and uh, I don't think you'll um, and, and that's good for you as a customer so um, probably know what NFS is you may or may not really know what NFS v4 is compared to NFS version 3 and how PNFS fits in so um, we you know NFS has been around for a long time um, after a few years after NFS version 3 was stable, they started NFS version 4. And it turns out they started it like 15 years ago. Um, and the main thing for uh, NFS v4 was improved user authentication, you know, Kerberos user credentials for users. And frankly, that's kind of a snoozer, okay? That's just really not all that exciting. Um, and there were some other, but there were some other important things like they integrated the file locking protocol and, and open delegations. It's like a like a Windows op lock, um, and they invented ACLs. It's a model more like Windows. Um, and interestingly, they added a way to uh, officially extend the protocol, which is sort of opened the door for PNFS. So the, f from our perspective, one of the key things is um, NFS v4 is a stateful server protocol. So the server tracks these things called delegations, which allow an NFS client to take and release locks on its own behalf. Um, and that's a that's a big change. Um, and it turns out PNFS needs a stateful server also. Uh, NFS version 4.1 adds even more. It adds PNFS, which I'm going to tell you in more detail about. It also adds um, a thing called directory delegations for efficiency. If you know what goes on inside an NFS file server, mostly what it does is service get attributes attempts as clients validate their caches by saying, is the file up to date? Is the file up to date? Has the file changed? Has the file changed? Mm -hmm. 
So directory delegations help optimize that workload. And then there's a, a change down at the RPC transport layer, um, this thing called sessions, which provides uh, a, a nice way to do at most once semantics at the RPC layer so that um, you don't replay a delete operation and get a spurious you know, int, um, that kind of thing. And it also is a, provides a natural place to plug in RDMA support. So PNFS, um, <clears throat> back in 2003 when I was, you know, we were working on Panassas trying to get it to work at all for our first customers and uh, Gary Greider, who's uh, sort of the godfather of high performance IO in the national labs, you know, he's like, hey, what about, what about doing, um, you know, PNFS, let's add parallel IO to the NFS standard. And I'm like, Sure. So it sounds like a great idea, you know. And then I'm thinking to myself, uh, no, it'll never happen. Okay, um, no way would the NFS community be excited, and we couldn't figure out how to do it, and it's not going to happen. But um, we hosted a workshop in November of 2004, and we got everybody to come. Uh, Peter Honeyman at University of Michigan hosted, and uh, there were people, you know, NetApp and Sun and Spinnaker and um, the QFS guys and the XFS, CXFS guys. Everybody showed up, which was pretty remarkable. And um, uh, it appeared that, you know, there was interest. Uh, we had to convince people that the goal of PNFS was not to solve all the problems with NFS, because there are some, if you're a file system guy, there are some deep problems with NFS, but you just got to get over it, right? NFS is good enough for a lot of things, even though it only has open to close cache consistency semantics, for example. Um, you know, as a practical matter, that's uh, good enough for a lot of things. At any rate, so it started in 2004. We started writing internet drafts in 2005, and here we are in 2011. So what, what's all the fuss about? Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to open up this blue data path from the file system clients to the storage devices. And we're going to move the file server off to the side. And you have this asymmetric architecture where the file server becomes just a, a metadata server and the clients are allowed to speak to the storage devices directly. Now this turns out to be this architecture that's shared with all the high performance file systems that I already talked about. Luster, Panassas, uh, GPFS, CXFS, iBricks, they all take this basic approach. EMC has a product that does this. And so we're going to try to take that basic idea and apply it to the NFS context. Uh, one, one more thing. We're also going to try to do it in a way that supports these different backends. And to me, that was the most controversial aspect going in. I was like, okay, well, sure, object storage is the best thing ever. And so, you know, but we're not going to convince NetApp to do object storage. And we're not going to convince EMC to do object storage. And EMC wants to do block-based stuff. And NetApp wants to do filers. And so how are we going to do this? So uh, what we've done is we factored it so that you can have different, different backends. And I'll, I'll explain how that works. So the, the PNFS standard is applies to the blue arrow on this drawing down there. So it's the it's the protocol between the client and the NFS file server. The green arrow is a storage protocol, like uh, could be also NFS if your storage devices are NFS servers, or it could be iSCSI OSD if you have object storage, or it could be block storage if your storage devices are just RAID arrays. Or it could be something else. And in fact, the first um, PNFS prototype was done on top of uh, PVFS2, which is a, another parallel file system. Um, and, then, and then there's this red arrow, which is sort of unspecified. It's whatever the metadata server thinks it needs to do to manage the storage devices. So for, like, in block base, there's really not a whole lot that they... Uh, that the metadata server can do. And in fact, sometimes metadata servers in those SAN file systems don't even have physical access to their devices. The main thing that uh, PNFS adds to the protocol is the notion of a layout. And a layout is just a map. It tells you where the data is. 
So um, when the client goes to the uh, file server, instead of doing a read or a write, it says layout get. It says, tell me, give me the map, and then the client's going to use that map and it's going to do the I.O. And the idea is that the file, your file is spread out across the storage devices somehow according to this map. Now, the, the map represents some state managed by the server, so he owns that state, and the server has the ability to recall that state. So if something changes, the data moves around because of online data migration or because of some repair or something, or the server's just not in the mood, um, he may recall the layout. The server, um, in addition, may not be in a position to give you a layout. Uh, doesn't want to or it can't. Um, and also the client may not be able to get a layout. It may be a NFS version 4 client, for example. So there's always the possibility that you don't have a layout and you do your reads and writes through the NFS server. Um, some implementations, for example, uh, think it's a good idea to always read and write small files through the file server. So uh, the picture, when you look at the system, looks like this. Um, in, in any NFS, you have uh, the NFS server layer, or NFSD, and that's stacked on top of some file system. So that's how NFS works today. You have your EXT3 or your UFS or your XFS, and you, um, you export that file system via NFS, and what that does is it basically mounts the, the NFSD layer on top of the underlying file system. So we're going to do that here, and we're going to augment that little API with uh, just a couple more operations where the NFSD layer can ask the underlying file system for a layout and give that to the client, and that the underlying file system can, can reach up and say, I, I need the layout back. Um, and then over on the client, you have your generic uh, NFS client, and then you, we've got to modify that generic uh, NFS client then we insert another little uh, module or boundary we call the layout driver. Think of it like a device driver. So this is the thing. So the, the layout information is generated here. It's passed through the PNFS server. It's opaque to the PNFS server and PNFS uh, client layers. So there's a type on it, though. And then the type selects the layout driver. And then the layout driver looks at that uh, layout and does the I.O. Okay, that's the basic architecture. Ah, and the main point here, the uh, super important point here is when you do this, you, ha you have a common file system client. Okay, so this is the Nirvana for me, the file system vendor. Okay, Panassas supports a lot of operating systems as long as they're Linux. Okay, so we do like 250 builds for our customers and that's just Linux. And we don't even do Solaris or AIX or any of those. Um, so what we'd like it is if everybody shipped a client that worked with our storage. And that's the advantage that an NFS server has today. And that's not an advantage that any high performance parallel file system has today. So from our vendor point of view, we really like this common client. And you as a customer, you would like to have it, you'd like to know that if you unpack your Red Hat, you know, 6.4 system, it'll be PNFS ready and you'll be able to speak to these different file systems. So um, who's participating? We heard uh, Blue Arc. Um, essentially all the, all the big NFS players are interested. Um, so this a quick list, um, a couple of things to worth noting. Uh, the Oak Ridge National Labs was, uh, has funded Panassas, um, and our, in turn, we've been uh, doing a, a lot of work in the Linux open source community to work on the, the uh, Linux client and the server. Um, and University of Michigan, um, the NFS maintainers for Linux were our resident in Ann Arbor, um, although they're now paid by NetApp and Red Hat. Um, but uh, City is also under contract from EMC to work on the block-based NFS, and under uh, and Microsoft is helping them do PNFS for Windows. And you can thank me personally because. Uh, 
Microsoft is like, hey, Panassas, we really want your object storage thing ported to Windows. And I'm like, I really don't want to do that. Um, I'd really much rather convince you guys to do PNFS. So uh, I planted that seed in there, you know, planted that seed a couple years ago, and it'll probably be another five years before it actually ships from them, but I think it'll happen, and that'll be a good thing. <clears throat> so the um, standard status, um, as I said, we wrote the first internet drafts in uh, 2005. By 2008, we had tentative approval of the draft in the very end of 2008. It took slightly more than a year for the uh, IETF editors to review the draft because the NFS version 4 group just rewrote all the NFS version 4 spec for the 4.1 spec. So it's, it's the largest ever internet draft. Um, and there's actually a family of them. There's the, uh, the main one, 5661. Um, which defines PNFS and how to do it with file servers as the data servers. And there's two companion drafts, one for layering um, PNFS over objects and one for laying PNFS over um, uh, block RAID devices. And this other one, this XDR thing, is just uh, they, they generate the header files um, from that other, uh, that other spec. So um, there's two important aspects of PNFS. There's the IETF standards effort, which we just talked about, and then there's the implementation effort. And um, of course, the vendors are working on their server side, but really, as a practical matter, um, the Linux development is key because until um, there's a widely deployed Linux client, it's not going to be real. Um, the Linux guys learned a little bit of a lesson in that uh, from NFS version 4, they didn't implement the whole spec, okay? So NFS version 4 in Linux is kind of okay, but it's not complete. And so when v4.1 came around, they're like, okay, we're going to make sure we do every mandatory feature of NFS version 4.1. And oh, by the way, PNFS is not a mandatory feature. So we're going to do things like server crash recovery before we do PNFS. And that's a good thing. Um, so, um, and I think most of that, but not actually not every bit of it's done on the server side especially. There's still some details that they're working on. Um, another, uh, so that's, that's basic NFS version 4.1, pretty much there. Uh, in terms of the object work, uh, one of the things that we started a few years ago was getting an iSCSI OSD stack into Linux. Um, OSD is a command set for, it's an official command set for SCSI, but it's complicated. It's got, you, you send and receive data, so it's bi-directional and it's got big CDB. So getting that into Linux was a year and a half, almost two year effort um, to start from patches to getting it fully adopted. Um, and a side effect of that was we have this, uh, there's a little file system in Linux called XOFS, which layers over an object storage device. So um, that's been in there for a little while. Um, and then we've, we're using that um, to do both a client and server side um, for PNFS. And one of the interesting attributes of the object-based backend for uh, PNFS is it supports RAID in a file, which is if you remember from uh, er, um, earlier, I've said that you know we, block rate is having a hard time now. Per file or object rate is the way to go, and you know the, this is supported in the PNFS context as well. Um, um, of course, this quote most stable and scalable implementation. Of course, that comes from my guys that are doing that, but you know they think that they're. Uh, in better shape than the, most of the other implementers, but we'll see. Um, now, there's a, for in terms of the files based back in, uh, what they're doing is they're taking GFS, which is the uh, little SAN file system that's in Linux, and they're exporting that view via uh, PNFS. And then for blocks, um, there's a little user-level server process that implements the uh, metadata server. Um, I would like to point out there's this uh, other server called Ganesha, which is a 
in a user level NFS server, which is uh, getting some interest and popularity today. It's a pretty good NFS uh, version 4.0 implementation that's being extended to support uh, PNFS. So um, note that one interesting aspect of the Linux community is they're not going to take um, even a PNFS client um, if the only servers is a bunch of uh, vendor proprietary servers. That, that's no good for them. So you need both the, Linux, the server side and the client side so they can test the code without having to you know, buy an EMC disk array, for example. Um, so that means, like for objects, we are going to create, a, well, we have created a little object-based uh, PNFS metadata server, which is essentially a, you know, feature-reduced version of our own product, and that's out there and available for for testing the the PNFS client. Similar for the blocks and files. Okay, so I've been giving talks about PNFS for a long time, and. Uh, it's always a constant year away. So let's see, how is it really gonna be ready this year? <laughs> and just to sort of tease myself, I, I pulled some um, quotes that I used in my various talks. Um, and you can, you can read through them here. But uh, one thing to note is that there was a big disconnect. It wasn't until about 2008 um, when we got serious about the Linux patch adoption process. So um, we'd already, we'd, Panassas, we'd learned about the iSCSI OSD by this point, and the, the, while there was a PNFS implementation, it was about a year behind the head of line Linux kernel. And so it wasn't until the end of 2008 that we, you know, got on a steady diet of updating the PNFS implementation to match every head of line kernel, and that's a full-time job. Um, and then, uh, so by, so we, so we caught up, and then we started folding stuff in. So things started to, uh, things did start to creep into the kernel. Um, but as you can see, it uh, always takes longer. That software stuff always takes a long time. Here's what we've done so far. Um, so you can see what happened in 2009, mostly infrastructure, purely for uh, uh, NFS version 4.1. Uh, last year, again, last year was really a big stabilization year for, for, for the 4.1 implementation. So the number of patches goes down, but the, it's mostly bug fixing. You know, if, as you may know, for in NFS, there are two or three um, interop tests each year. And so developers get together and they test and they fix bugs in real time. Um, some chunks of actual PNFS code came in in 237 at the end of last year. And then right now there's the 238 2638 merge window just happened, and um, you actually can sort of kind of use uh, some parts of PNFS, uh, like for read only access in 2638. NetApp, uh, you know, Mike Eisler blogged about it, but it's still. Um, still not all the code is adopted upstream. There's still about the remaining work has been divided up into about four big batches and the first batch went in in 2638 and the rest of it still has to come in. Um, but but it's going to happen. It's happening. You know, it's uh, like I said, it's, it feels like it's been a constant year away, but I've been paying close attention and you can definitely see the, the progress being made. Um, we had, for example, we had a very key meeting in February uh, a few weeks ago where we had a sort of emergency IETF working group meeting and we had people from uh, the Linux maintainers and NetApp and um, uh, Panassas and a bunch of other people all there debating some fine points. We didn't even actually have to change anything in the protocol, but we had to agree on some some fine points in the in the protocol around layout commit. Um, but I, you know, as a practical matter, I, I can tell you right now that the patch adoption process is going to stretch um, throughout 2011. Okay, in the remainder of my time, and I think I got plenty of it. Um, the 
I'm just going to describe a little performance testing that we did in the Panassas labs. Um, so this was done last fall. Benny and Boaz are uh, two guys that have uh, been focused on PNFS for Panassas. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to take the same storage cluster and we're going to run the Panassas direct flow client. That's what we call our proprietary client. And we're going to run the PNFS client and we're going to just compare the performance. Um, it's a, it's some older hardware. It's about a, a four, 4 4.8 gigabyte per second uh, rack of stuff. And we have a modest number of clients, 128, and a few fast clients, although I don't have the, the results from that. Then we're just going to do so-called end-to-end streaming I.O. So every client's going to open its own file and read or write it. Okay, so what's what's going on? So you've got, if you just had the Panassa system, you'd have your compute node, and you've got your client driver, which is sitting inside the kernel, and you've got your metadata server over on the side, and you're going to send some RPCs to the Panassas metadata server to find out where the data is, and then once you've figured it out, you're going to do iSCSI OSD reads and writes in parallel to the storage blades. And there might be some some back-end message traffic from the metadata server down there. Now in PNFS, it looks like this. Um, you have an extra hop in the metadata path, but the I.O. path is direct. And the extra hop isn't really a big deal, and in fact, um, a good parallel file system implementation will allow that client to cache a bunch of state. So I got a couple dollar signs that represents the cache of attributes and data. So once the PNFS clients start accessing files, the uh, this little direct flow client here is going to cache a bunch of state. And that's what we do for our NFS export of the Panassa system. Right? So today we have an NFS export, which is exactly like this, except that it's not a PNFS server stacked on top of it. It's just a regular NFS server, and you just go. You, you mount the NFS server, and there's a huge cache in that client um, that optimizes access to the parallel file system underneath it. Okay. Any questions on that? Oh, here's some more details. So we had 12 shelves of pretty old hardware. Um, so that's just to compare, for example, with uh, you get the same performance out of three shelves or three or four shelves of our current product, but anyway, any rate, um, and a bunch of sort of old, you know, two, uh, what is this, two single core sockets, yeah, so you can get an idea of uh, the vintage of this equipment. And we're doing IO zone like stuff. Um, now it's worth noting or reminding ourselves that when you're, um, the way we do RAID, this profile RAID means that when a client writes data, they also write some redundant data. So they're going to write parity information. Um, and that's extra data that they transmit over the network and they store in different storage devices. And you'll see the difference in the read and write performance because of that. Hey, voila. So here's our number. And now, if you remember, the um, the storage system is sort of a four, you know four and a half gigabyte per second storage system. So by 128 clients, we're starting to saturate the storage system. So that's why the goes. That's why the uh, graphs have that shape. Um, down here at the low end, the PNFS client slightly better, slightly faster. Um, partly that's because the PNFS client is simpler. The Panassas client has is very fancy. It does cache consistency and all this great stuff. Uh, that means the code paths are a little bit longer. Um, but at the high client count, the the native client does better, um, and that's um, partly because the uh, again it's a fancy client, so it's got better read ahead and it's doing some, um, some other, uh, some other clever things. And, and also we, 
we're still trying to figure out exactly why the differences are. But um, certainly for read, because the, this purple line is read, and that means that the read ahead is not working as well as the Panassas read ahead. And that's a, the way read ahead is done is a feature of the, the generic layers in the Linux client. <laughs> Uh, you can also see this difference between read and write. So if you look at the uh, those top two curves, the green line and the blue line, that's the difference between read and write. And um, they track very closely, and it's just the really literally the difference between transmitting the extra data over the wire and the write path. Okay. Um, here's a couple pointers. So there is always a complete PNFS implementation, even though the full code base is not uh, accepted upstream um, yet. More and more of it is accepted, but uh, if you really want to do, uh, if, if you want a complete PNFS, you need to get the, the uh, you need to get the source tree and build your own kernels. Um, uh, there's a guy at Red Hat who does experimental RPMs for Fedora, so that's another way to do it. If you're a Fedora core user, you can pull those RPMs down. Uh, the NFS discussion, uh, discussions about PNFS are on the main Linux NFS mailing list. And then if you're interested in object storage, uh, there's a little openosd.org website. Uh, that's where you can pull down an object storage target, for example. Um, and then if you're a Git, the Linux, the Linux uh, source code management system is called Git. And uh, so here's a pointer to that uh, repository for the, for the tree. Um, pointers to the PNFS. Okay. And some re references, and I think, yes, we're done. Questions?